Good morning. Good morning. Welcome this morning to Goddard United Methodist Church. It's a wonderful day to be in God's house. It's Sunday. This is where we should be, right? Amen. Praising God and all of those who love Jesus and are thankful for Jesus and are running late. No, just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I didn't even mean that. <laughs> anyway, we are so thankful. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I have ears in the side of my nose. Anyway, uh, we are grateful that you all are here this morning. We have lots going on this week, as you have known, and the flowers this morning, the altar flowers, uh, are given to the glory of God and in memory of Jerry Eubanks by his wife Elizabeth and the Eubanks family. The red carnation is placed in honor of the 93rd birthday on um, July 14th of Bobby Young, and we want to wish Bobby a very, 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 very happy birthday. If you have a chance, I know you'll want to send her a card. She would love it. She does have difficulty seeing, but she will get help, and that would tickle her. And then we have a white carnation for my mom, and uh, we appreciate all your love and prayers and reaching out, and I know that she would. Uh, so I just thank you on behalf of my family for all that you have done. And then we also have another white carnation, which honors the passing of Virginia Kennedy, which was also a big surprise this week. Uh, her service will be here, mom's service, I should have said that, will be here at 5.30 tomorrow afternoon. So hopefully you can just get off work and come by and you don't have to take any extra time or anything. But if you would like to come, I would love for you to be here so we can celebrate together. Uh, then. Uh, and there will be no, we'll, it'll be a private burial, so that will be on Tuesday morning, so you don't have to worry about any of that. Then on Tuesday morning here is Virginia's service, and her service is at 10 a.m. here in the sanctuary. And so I know that Larry and Greg would love for you to be here with them also. Greg has made his way to Fort Smith, and so that's something very important. Virginia touched so many lives throughout her thousands of years teaching in the Fort Smith Public Schools and so many uh, different cultures. She translated for so many different people and helped in just a million ways. And so we will be celebrating her life, as I said, uh, on, the, on Tuesday at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary. We do continue to remember Jerry uh, Eubanks, his whole family, and we continue, of course, to remember Elizabeth and hold her high in our prayers. We have many people who are not well. So when you look around, do, please do not say everyone is, uh, is on vacation because they're not on vacation. There are many people who are on vacation, but there are many people who are not well. So when you look at your list of your prayer or you get the prayer chain, please know that these folks need your prayers more than you even know. So just take a few moments, if you have a few moments, and remember that. Also this morning, I wanted to lift up to you Kathy Smith, whose mother, Bonnie, also passed away this week. Her service was Tuesday, yes. And so it's been a tough week for moms this week. And you know what's interesting? Of course, Greg Kennedy and I are only children, and you do have some siblings, right? Kathy, you don't have any siblings? You're an only child too. You know, I was thinking that, but I didn't know whether to say that. I thought, because I thought that, I thought it's interesting that all the only children's mothers passed away this week. Isn't that, it's sort of interesting, isn't it? Maybe not. But I was thinking that. Anyway, I've offered many, many prayers, and we're thankful that she's in worship this morning too. So we do welcome you to this time of glorifying God and worshiping Him together.
would take your hymnal please this morning and turn to hymn number 577 and please stand as ye are able to sing God of grace and God of glory.
It's a privilege at this time for us to bring <coughs> our prayers for the congregation to God. Won't you pray with me now? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Because of Jesus, we are holy and blameless in your sight. Because of Jesus' blood, we are ransomed. We are forgiven. We are continually swimming in the water of your overflowing grace. We read your word, and we know these promises in our minds. But sometimes our hearts are sad, and we need an extra measure of your love. We need to feel a holy hug through the arms of your Holy Spirit. This week has been hard. Loved ones have, have died. Others are fighting illnesses. And others have challenges that they're keeping to themselves. They're not sharing with others. Today, we ask that you supply the strength each person here and watching and listening the strength that each person needs for the situation they experience. We ask for you to encourage us as we continue working and serving you each day. And we thank you because you have promised to supply our needs. And now together, we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I'd love to invite the children to come forward. Come on, take on. It says, Amen. 
Sometimes we say amen. Depends on how fancy we're feeling that day, you know? <laughs> yeah, amen. Well, I used to think that amen meant the end. You know? Maybe it make would make sense, right? We're done praying, amen, the end. Well, that's not quite what it means. Sometimes it does feel like it means the end. But it actually means so be it. Or sometimes we'll say it when uh, maybe, maybe Pastor Kim's preaching and we just really agree with what she's saying and we'll say, amen, you know? That kind of means like, I agree, you know? Boy, make that right, make it so, you know? Do that, God, that's awesome, okay? That's what amen sounds like, or what it means, okay? What about, oh, we already did that one. Here, I have an idea. You can hold the amen so I don't use it again. You can hold the hallelujah, all right? So now we're gonna pull out another one. Oh, this is a big one. Benediction, thank you for our good readers. Boy, that's the, that's the big word. That usually happens at the end of the service, right? A benediction is when uh, Pastor Kim says, okay, you've been blessed. It means a blessing, okay? You're blessed, God loves you, but it also kind of comes with this job attached to it too. It also means, that, okay, you've been blessed. Now go out in the world and bless other people too and make sure they know about Jesus. So that's what benediction is. Here, you can hold that one. Would you like to hold that one? All right. Okay. I got another one. What about this one? Gospel. Okay, Trilby's got this. What you got? Very good. That's a book in the Bible. In fact, there are four of them. Four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the extra special books because they're all about Jesus and what he did on earth. Okay? So Gospel means good news. So what's the good news about? Jesus, right? There you go. All right. Here, you can hold that one. Okay? Now, ooh, this is a good one. <gasps> What's this word? Altar. All right, Trilby's got this, I think. Yeah, you are 100% right. She goes, I think it's that thing. It is right here, yeah. The altar is that special spot in the servants, in the whole church. And you notice, with the cross, and the candles on it, and the Bible, and then sometimes we put communion on there too, yeah. Okay, the altar. Did you notice that if you look around, the choir, Pastor Kim and Sammy, and the entire congregation, no matter where you are in the room, where are you looking right at? The altar. It's a special spot, and it's a very sacred place that we have our focus on during church. Because even if you're in the balcony, you're right. You can still look right at that. Okay, who wants another one? You can have another. All right, I got two more. Ooh, this is a good one. I bet you guys know this word. Sin. sin. Very good. What's sin? Sin means that like, uh, you did a bad thing. Perfect. That is exactly right. Sin is when you did a bad thing. Something that God doesn't smile about, right? And usually, and it means you've got to ask for forgiveness for it. So very good. Okay. How about this? We aren't even going to hold that one. We'll stick that over there. <laughs> All right. Now, the one word I've got left for today is a very special word that we just sang about in the choir. In fact, the whole song is called this. Grace. That was a good song, wasn't it? Oh, some people use it as a name. That's true. Grace is a very special gift from God for when we do this thing, the sin thing, you know? Yeah. When we do that, it's forgiveness. Very good, Jason. It means that God understands that we made a boo-boo. And even though, amen. <laughs> She's like, amen. <laughs> yeah. God understands we had a boo-boo. We don't feel very good about it. And he gives us grace, kind of like a second chance, even though we don't deserve it. So 
when we sing Amazing Grace, that's what we're talking about, okay? We, we don't deserve it, because we messed up a lot, but God gives us this grace and lets us try again. When we mess up next time, we ask for forgiveness, and God gives us grace. That is right. Okay. Well, you can keep your complimentary signs from me. Okay. I know that's a big excitement for the day. All right. Let's pray first before we go, and we'll say amen at the end, won't we? Okay. Here we go. Dear God, thank you for these wonderful words and helping us understand you and the Bible and church. We love you so very much, and thank you for the amazing grace that you give us. We love you. Amen. I was like, fancy, did you notice? <laughs> We're going to invite the ushers, if they will, to come forward, please. It is time for the gathering of God's tithes and our offerings. Let's bow our heads. Gracious God, you have given us grace upon grace, and we are a blessed people. And as we come this morning during this special time, help us to actually be a witness. Help us to accept this time or to look forward to this time with joy. That out of all that you have given us, we get the chance to give back to you. And as we give, fill our lives with a new purpose and with a new wish that as we give this gift, it would be used for those in need, for those who uh, come our way, and for those who work so hard constantly in your house. So many more people are reached through these gifts than we can ever imagine, and we give them gladly this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
be seated. I do want to say very briefly to you um, how grateful I am to be your pastor, how grateful I am that you are my family. I've told you that many, many times, and, um, and that's the one important thing for me as I have a new life, is that um, I'm by myself. <laughs> so I am so grateful. Robert, of course, is in Bella Vista with his family, and then Mark is basically in Little Rock, right outside of Little Rock. And so I have the best neighbors in the world, Bobby and Gail Williams, and so thank God when my doors were literally blowing open last night, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I thought, uh-oh, so anyway. <laughs> uh, so they did, they checked, you know, it's like, are you okay over there? And I'm like, yeah, except that my doors are literally blowing open. I keep locking them and they blow open. But uh, I am blessed and I know that. And you all are my blessing. I've shared with this, you all, uh, this before with you all, I, I serve with the world's greatest people. I truly, 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 and I want you to know that, not only from the bottom of my heart, but the folks who work with you and uh, serve with you love God. And that's, that, that's all of these people that you see. Uh, Don's in the back, so I can't really point at him, but you know who they are. They believe in God, they are respectful, they uh, sincerely believe in everything they do, up, up to Tim in the balcony. I mean, it's, it's uh, and we are blessed as a congregation to have uh, what I would call para staff <laughs> who come in and help us do so many things um, in terms of bulletins and just all the things that we don't, that we take for granted, the grass, the, just everything. It takes a village and you all are a faithful village and this staff is, uh, you'll never have, well, I, I can say this because I'm not including myself, you'll never have another staff like this. This is the best staff I have ever, ever, ever worked with and they are, they are incredible. And so I want you to know that you are always in good hands. They step up when they need to. I don't ever think about last week when my mother fell out of her chair, I didn't even think about, you know, uh, what would happen, I just knew that I was calling Carrie at the break of dawn and I mean, it's just, they can do anything and I'm thankful for that. They can all, they, it's those people with the scripture talks about one, two, five gifts, they have 22 gifts. And I'm just thankful that they can do more than one thing or the, this is hysterical, the one thing they were hired to do. So anyway, these are not hired people as the scripture talks about, Jesus talks about, they are friends. And I hope that you recognize that. Now let's talk about Jesus. So uh, we're gonna look at Mark this morning. And uh, this is from the sixth uh, chapter of Mark. We're gonna begin to read in verse one and continue through verse six. Listen for the word of God. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all this? What's this wisdom he's been given? What about the powerful acts accomplished through him? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? They were repulsed by him and fell into sin. They were repulsed by him and fell into sin. Jesus said to them, prophets are honored everywhere except in their own hometowns, among their relatives, and in their own households. He was unable to do any miracles there, except that he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was appalled, meaning Jesus, he was appalled by their disbelief. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's bow our heads together. Gracious God, as we come before you this morning and as we hear this passage, we are 
always so grateful to hear from you even when we don't understand. And so this morning, whether it's through me or it's <laughs> despite me, however we hear you, God, let us hear you. And let it touch the lives that are needing a word. Um, and I don't even know what that's about, but I know that there are those who are maybe listening to us from home, wherever we may be, whether we're gathered here or wherever else. We know that when we ask for you, when we need you, that you were there before we even ask. And we praise you for that, just as we praise you for the grace that Carrie talked about. We understand that you are the author of all things, that you are the creator, and that you will take us home. You are the Alpha and the Omega, and we praise you for that. And now we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together would truly be acceptable in, in your sight, because you are our rock and our redeemer, and you are every breath we take. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, by the time we come to Mark 6, which is where we are this morning, Jesus is on a roll. Have you noticed that? He's on a roll, and he's moved from his baptism to calling the disciples, and uh, word about Jesus has then been spreading to the surrounding countryside. Crowds are beginning to gather around him to listen to him teach, and people are bringing the sick on mats to be healed by him. And in chapter 6, verse 1, we read these words. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. And the expectation is that Jesus will experience even greater success in his hometown of Nazareth. After all, if people who don't know him are flocking to him, right? <laughs> if people who then could be considered strangers are coming to him, then you can imagine the positive reception that he's going to get from those who have been his family, those who are his friends, people who have known him his whole life, right? Well, that's not what happens. What happens in Nazareth could be seen in the eyes of the world, our world even today, as failure. Failure. The Gospels do not whitewash anything, and I hope you pick that up over the years. They don't whitewash anything, and here's an example of Jesus experiencing rejection in his own hometown, and they have recorded it. Mark has recorded it for us. But it's not a failure of Jesus that's recorded in this story. It's a failure of the people to receive Jesus, and in that, we learn a few lessons about what's going on and what's about to happen and what we're getting into. Because in every story about Jesus um, and people, we learn more about the Savior and more about ourselves. Because actually, and I've shared this with you before, Scripture is a mirror. You may not think it. You don't see what we think of as a mirror. But Scripture is a mirror that we hold up to our own faces. And whether we like it or not, we usually find at least a little bit of ourselves represented in the people that we encounter in the scripture. So what goes wrong in Nazareth? And what do we learn about the, who this Jesus is? And maybe, perhaps, what do we learn about ourselves? Well, the first thing I would share with you this morning is probably popping right off the page for you, and that is we learn the power of opinion. The power of opinion. And I want to start with that power of opinion. Maybe you've noticed this, uh, but most folks place a lot of um, stock in their own opinions. They just do, especially when it comes to opinions about other people. Most folks form an opinion about you based on their first encounter with you. People make snap decisions about other people, and then it can be next to impossible 
to undo that snap decision. If someone decides that you are the best person who's ever lived and completely trustworthy, their opinion isn't going to change even if you give them every reason to believe the opposite. If someone decides that you, uh, that really all you do is lie, and this is very true, that all you do is lie, then no matter what you do, even if you tell the truth and have never even told a lie, it's not gonna matter because typically once folks form an opinion, there's no going back. People are confident in their opinions. They may have bad self-esteem, but they're confident in their opinions. People put trust in their own opinions. People have pride in their own opinions because ego gets involved and to change an opinion about someone might mean that we were wrong and that might mean that we have to reevaluate how we see someone and that might even entail apologizing and of all that it can take on or what we will come up with or what we really need is a great deal of humility. But the tragedy is that our opinion about someone might be blocking us from the blessing of truly getting to know them. The tragedy in the story this morning is that the opinion of the people of Nazareth block them from seeing Jesus and this saving relationship that he offers even when it's right in front of them. Can you imagine that? Jesus is right in front of them. And so look at verse two if you still got your Bible open. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him, this is what the scripture says, many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all this? What's the wisdom he's been given? What about the powerful acts accomplished through him? Now catch this, catch this. The people admit that he's speaking with wisdom, right? And that he's accomplishing powerful acts. They admit the profundity of his words and the miracles that he is performing. There is no doubt. It's all happening, as I said, right in front of them. And the expectation is that this collective recognition will lead to a collective profession of faith. And yet we go on to just verse three, the very, the very next verse, and it says, they say, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters even here with us? And the scripture records, as I highlighted for you a minute ago, they were repulsed by him and fell into sin. So do you see what's happening here? <laughs> the people's opinion of who Jesus is blocks them from truly seeing who Jesus is. And so married are they to their opinion about who Jesus is that they are unwilling to have their opinion changed based on what is right in front of them. The opinion of the people is based on their, get this, on their being too familiar with Jesus. Some of you may be thinking, but being familiar with Jesus is a good thing. That means we're in relation with him, right? A relationship with him, right? And that is true. However, there is a negative connotation of familiarity perfectly summed up in that famous phrase from Chaucer. Who remembers Chaucer? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, I had that class at 740 every day of the week. I, okay, whatever. But anyway, the famous phrase from Chaucer you know this phrase, if, even if you don't know it's Chaucer. Familiarity breeds content. That's right. And the meaning of that is simple. We can be exposed to someone or to something so much that we get bored with that person or that thing. Sometimes that's what happens in marriages or in friendships. 
We find ourselves bored with that person or whatever we're doing because, and this is important for us to hear, especially if this is happening in marriages, because we know all there is to know. We cannot be surprised. Our opinion on a person or a thing is the same thing as closing a book and slamming it shut. That's what I believe is happening with the people of Nazareth. They think they know Jesus. They've seen Jesus grow up. They know him as a carpenter. They know Jesus' mother and his brothers and his sisters. They know his father. Their grandmother used to be best friends with his grandmother. <laughs> Jesus, we know who you are. And here's the mirror piece for us. Here's the, here's the looking in the mirror for us. Do we believe we know all there is to know about Jesus? Do we really believe that? When we go to read our Bibles, are we ever prepared to be surprised? Hmm. To hear a verse of scripture in a new way? To see some new aspect of the Savior or of God? To be convinced by the Holy Spirit in a way we weren't expecting? Or to be led by the Spirit in a direction that we couldn't ever have envisioned? Or do we say, I've read my Bible daily for years and years. I know this story like the back of my hand. Do we ever come to worship with the expectation that we're going to be surprised? Are we prepared in the middle of singing a hymn to see God in a new light? To have him speak to us in the middle of singing that hymn that thinking about some valley maybe that we're walking through. One of the greatest threats to our walk of discipleship is familiarity breeding contempt. We think we know all there is to know, and for many this leads to our opinions being formed that we know what Jesus will do and what Jesus won't do. You see, the glory, the glory of Jesus the Son and God the Father is we can rest on the truth and the reality that God so loved the world that he sent his only Son into it so that all might be saved and not condemned. And that Jesus defeated sin and death with his own death, his own resurrection, but past that every day of our lives, we're living in the reality that the goodness of God will never cease to surprise us if we're paying attention. And at times, even when we're not. We believe, and remember this before, we believe a storm is greater than Jesus. That was week before last. We believe a storm is greater than Jesus. Only for Jesus to silence it and carry us through. That's what happens. We find that God provides new mercies each and every morning. We turn to scripture and we read a story that we've read a thousand times only to be surprised, only to be surprised to find a new truth or a new insight into the mercy of God. And instead of saying, I should have seen that sooner, instead we can say with all humility, Thank you, God, for this new insight. And what I found in my own life is that those new insights come right when I need them most, and especially at times when I didn't even know I needed them. Because we can't count on the opinion that we know what we need, because when we tell God, well, well if we do that, then we tell God, what we need, and lo and behold, God might provide something different that is far better because who knows what we need better than God. Notice what we learn about the Savior in this story. And that's our number two thought for the day. This failure, and this is so crucial, 
This failure did not change the miss mission of Jesus. I love verse 6. Verse 6 says, He was appalled by their disbelief. Now that's Jesus saying that. He was appalled by their disbelief. And then Jesus traveled through the surrounding villages teaching. And the very verse that Jesus is appalled by the people's belief, unbelief, he keeps going. He goes to all the surrounding villages. The failure of the people to receive, to receive Jesus didn't change his mission one bit. The rejection of people, and I want you to think about this all the time when you get worried about things, the rejection of people cannot change Jesus, cannot change what Jesus did or will do, has done, has defeated death. Whether we believe that or not, it's true, and it's not going to change. No matter who rejects it, who just says, that doesn't make sense to me, so what? Nothing changes Jesus and his mission. They can't stop Jesus. So I want to ask you, how often do we experience rejection in our own lives? And when we experience that rejection, we are tempted to completely shut down. Perhaps we shared our witness with someone once, and perhaps we shared the gospel with someone once, and they didn't receive it well at all and shrugged it off. And perhaps then we decided that we would never try that again with anybody else. <laughs> and yet we find even Jesus met with rejection with people he knew, and he kept on. As new creations, which we are, we are called to model the love of God and the love of neighbor. But what do we do when the kindness we live and share with others is rejected. Perhaps we encourage and support and we encounter someone who is nothing but bitter and responds to our kindness with hate. Perhaps that happens. And what we're tempted to do, of course, is to give it right back to them. But the point is, the rejection of others doesn't change our witness just as the rejection of others did not change the mission of Jesus because our witness is not and Jesus' mission was not given by people. Our mission, Jesus' mission, is given to us by God. The last thing I want to say to you quickly is that the rejection of the people of Nazareth didn't change the mission of Jesus but what does that mean for all people? Now, hear the good news. This is the good news. Jesus would continue on to, where? On to Jerusalem. And he would die, and he would be raised, not just for the disciples, not just for those who believed in him already, but even for the people who had sat in the synagogue in Nazareth and rejected him. Even for those people, he would continue on to Jerusalem. The rejection of the people would not stop this salvific work of Jesus Christ, and their initial reaction and rejection would not be the final word. We don't have the final word no matter what we think. None of Jesus' four brothers believed in him when he was alive. You may not know that, but that's true. But at least James, and you saw the resurrected Jesus, and if you look at it in 1 Corinthians, it's in chapter 15, verse 7. And Jude did so after his resurrection, and both would become leaders in the early church, and both would author the epistles. Even in the midst of our sin and our rejection, Jesus died for each and every one of us, so that by the grace carry of God, so that by the grace of God, we would be turned from our sin and rejection and proclaim Jesus as the Lord and Savior of our lives 
And so in turn, we would become sons and daughters of God so that we might be surprised by the goodness of God and daily we would be led by the Spirit to show love and mercy to the world around us, to family, to friends, to strangers. What we celebrate is that even if we have found rejection from others, when we try to witness, Jesus is still working through that person and is still working in and through us. And we have to believe that. Bob used to say that to me all the time. I, I feel like I would fail in confirmation and he would say, who was the first person that, that ever told you about Jesus? I don't know, mom. Well, who was after that? Well, I don't know. Well, of course you don't know. How many people do you think have told you about Jesus? I don't know. Well, of course you don't. And you will be one of those people in the process that will tell these children as they grow up to be doctors and lawyers, and we're finding that to be true now. I think about Jenny Mankin, who's now Margaret Cox, but I hear her good name everywhere about what an awesome doctor she is. And I tried to tell y'all <laughs> when they were coming up for children's time, these people are going to be fabulous. They're going to do great things in their life, but they're going to do it through their faith. And it's that faith as they care for others that makes all the difference. It's that faith as we deal with others that makes all the difference in our relationships. And so this morning I want to say thanks be to God that he daily defies our expectations of his goodness. Thanks be to Jesus Christ that he doesn't quit on us. And thanks be to the Holy Spirit that opens our hearts more and more and more to the realities of God's goodness and mercy and daily provides the courage that we need to share our witness. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all the people said, Amen. Amen. This morning, if you will be standing as we sing together 377, it is well with my soul.
the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Amen.